Hello everyone. Hi, uh, um, I just want to say a, a few words before we start this, uh, this course. Sorry, I hear myself double. Yeah. Um, so um, we're starting a, a new text, uh, Entering into the Middle Way uh, by Chandra Kirti. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Geshema, for, uh, for teaching us. Um, I want to uh, remind everyone that uh, uh, this is all done um, voluntary, and we get here another opportunity to practice our generosity. Uh, we can do that through uh, the Dharma Friends of Israel website. Um, the donation will go to our teacher and covering the expenses of the course. Uh, we have the WhatsApp group, which we uh, are using from uh, the previous study. So we'll keep on using that. If there are any new people here that want to join, um, I will post the link here on the chat and also uh, you can find it on the website. And I'm uh, sending now also a text here in the chat that uh, that we will study. Uh, it uh, uh, will be available uh, to download here from the chat of the. Let's see. Okay, so it's um, uh, you can download it from the chat of the Zoom um, uh, window. Uh, it will this this will not be published on the website so if you have any issues with that you can uh, email me uh, or talk to me through whatsapp or anything and i will uh, make sure you, you get the text okay um, thank you very much and geshema you can take the lead okay all right well uh shalom everyone uh good evening or good afternoon wherever you are right now Good morning, maybe, I don't know. Um, well, it's lovely to be back this time with another text. This time, one of the texts that is studied most when it comes to the subject of Madhyamika, this is the, the text that is studied most in this tradition, in the Galupa tradition. And also, of course, also in the other tradition, it's widely studied. And I'll say a little bit about this text. Um, I was asked by one Leora to say a little bit about the text, about its background, and I'll definitely do that to give you whatever information I have to pass that on to you. And by the other Leora, I was asked to include meditation. So I'm thinking to do that as well, to give you the opportunity to meditate um, on this text. Maybe not today, just because today it's more introductory, but we'll start this session with meditation. We start with meditation, why? Because what I'd like you to do is to do a visualization meditation, to visualize Buddha in front of you, Chandakirti, to visualize this enlightened being in the space in front of you. And such is the power of the mind. If we do these kind of visualizations, Nagarjuna, Chandakirti, the main kind of, um, masters if you like the main teachers that are connected to the text we study it is said that we're through this visualization we're more inspired by their presence it's almost like the text comes alive in their presence and although we just visualize this this is said to be in accordance with reality because their mind just like our own mind cannot be destroyed and is still around and if they've attained the full enlightenment of a Buddha can actually manifest right where we visualize them to be. So therefore, I'd like to start with some breathing meditation, just to settle the mind, calm the mind, let go of any disruptive thoughts, ideas, etc. Then I'll say a few words about the visualization. Of course, very important then to set the motivation the motivation in this case to 
become fully enlightened to have reached the awakened state of the Buddha for the welfare of all sentient beings. I just assume that all of you know what this means, um, having a background, because this is a, well, an advanced text. And of course, we learn more about it as we go along. But anyway, to set the motivation, and then we do a few prayers together, refuge in Bodhicitta, and then the four measurables. And what I'd like to do is with the four measurables, it's just four lines, I take a, few, a short break for you to be able to reflect on the words that you just recited. So it's about sentient beings, happiness, being free from suffering, because that's the main motivation. We're doing this for the welfare of all sentient beings, wishing to be awakened um, and having generated the wish to become awakened, to reach the state of a Buddha, we then engage in the activity of actually visualizing we are responsible now for the welfare of sentient beings, happiness, suffering, and so forth. Okay, so let's start with a few moments of just breathing, breathing meditations, even though we're not in the same space, but we're in that same group, so it works in the same way. Just be mindful of your breath. And then in order to be able to generate the mind of enlightenment or bodhicitta, let's first generate compassion, great compassion, a loving attitude that wishes for all sentient beings to be free from suffering. So even if it requires some effort, to the best of your ability, try to generate that mind, a sense of closeness, of affection towards all living beings. And then the wish, may they be free from any type of suffering, any type of limitation, and so forth. And then the wish, may I be able to assist sentient beings, lead sentient beings to such a state, free from all problems, from all limitations. And in order to be able to do that, may I attain 
the state of a fully awakened Buddha. I'll be able to transform my mind into the awakened mind of an enlightened Buddha. Visualize that you generate that mind in front of the Buddha himself. Also in the presence of great beings such as Nagarjuna, Ayurdeva, Buddha Palita and Chandakirti. Even if you know very little about them, just visualize these great masters in the space in front of you, in particular the Buddha himself. And then generate the wish to become enlightened the welfare of all sentient beings. And to think that, so today, learning about Chandakyati's text, Entry into the Middle Way, may this become one of the causes for me to totally purify my mind so that I can reach that awakened state of a Buddha. and be able to be of greatest benefit to myself, but also to all sentient beings. And then without losing this motivation, let's recite the prayers together. Shir, if you can display them on the screen. So I'll read it three times and wherever you are, please recite it as well together. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, 
may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. And then the four measurables. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. All right, so having set the motivation. Well, before we start the text, well, I'm very grateful to Gila, first of all, because just a few moments before I signed in, she sent me a newer version of the test or the text that we're gonna do together. It's, uh, it's been translated by Geshe Thukdin Jimpa. And I only had an older version so there was a newer version that was made available for the last teachings. And since I didn't get permission, well, I didn't even uh, try to get permission to set it on the website. I think it's just easier because it was contributed, it was, it was distributed before. So it's easier just to make it available to you sending it, well, put it on the web, on the WhatsApp group. So it's not widely available. <clears throat> Next year, I, I just saw, It'll be uh, for sale, but in the meantime, that's what we can use. So, as you know, it's Chandakirti's text. And uh, I'll say a little bit about Chandakirti, but there's very little known about him, very little known about his own life. So the little that I do know, I'll share with you. But what is even more important is to start off with how it all fits in, how this text, this particular text, how does it fit into, well, the whole context of the Buddhist teachings, why it's important, um, what it explains basically, what it talks about. So usually the way this is described is of course to go back to the Buddha himself. So the Buddha 2,500 years ago who attained enlightenment attained a state which is actually basically the Buddha having the same mind that we do, but having removed what's extra, what's not supposed to be in our mind. And what's extra in a sense, it's not in the nature of our mind, but it's that which causes us so much trouble, so many problems. And so the Buddha discovered a way to remove what's extra in the mind. So enlightenment, being a Buddha, etc all these fancy terms, in actuality, what they mean is to remove what's not in the nature of the mind, what's extra. There are certain states of mind, certain emotions that are not supposed to be there. And because of their presence, we have problems, anxieties, we have trouble, we have, we have the whole, uh, well, the whole variety of different problems and sufferings. So they can be removed if we remove their causes. And the Buddha has basically set forth, has taken his understanding and explained to us, well, how we can remove what's extra in the mind and remove our problems, our suffering. And having studied about Buddhism a little bit, I've done not that much. I mean, there are people who study so much more, but having studied as much as I have, 
the conclusion I've come to is that Buddhism is a form of psychology. Psychology in the sense, well, first of all, it's the science of the mind, understanding how the mind really works. That's the basis, but with a certain goal to remove all the unwanted experiences, such as problems, sufferings, etc., <clears throat> the unsatisfactory nature of our existence, and replace it with a mind that is satisfied and that lives its fullest potential, that is able to express its nature in the sense of limitless love, compassion, wisdom, and so forth. And that's in another, in another, if you put it in another way, that's the fully awakened state. So I know that some people hesitate to say that Buddhism is a form of psychology because nowadays the word psychology is used for a system that helps us to deal with everyday problems. It's not about past lives and future lives, etc. It's just to do with this life's issues, but most terminologies we use that we borrow from, well, from the English language in this case, they mean something quite different, if not in the Buddhist context. So the mind, consciousness, uh, our experiences, they're explained quite differently. And still we use words to then convey the Buddhist idea. So I don't see any problem in saying that Buddhism is a form of psychology, but not psychology that is only concerned with just the well-being and happiness of this life. Although it's part of that, of course, and we start off with that in mind, but it goes even further. But everything in Buddhism is really about understanding the mind and transforming it and understanding that there are certain states of mind that are just good for us. So what we call religious states of mind, such as devotion, uh, faith, they're actually good for us. If what we have devotion towards, if, we have, if that which we have faith in is something positive, is something that helps us to learn. So it's not for the sake of God, for the sake of Buddha or anyone else but ourselves. If we generate certain states of mind to be inspired, to have devotion, towards someone who has qualities that we aspire towards. And through this devotion and this kind of joyful faith, we are then more open to acquiring, to developing the same qualities. There's this joy in the mind. Devotion and faith are actually joyful states of mind that open the mind to such a degree that we learn to generate the same or cultivate the same qualities that the person we are devoted towards possesses him or herself already. But of course, what's also really important as part of Buddhist psychology is also the understanding that all our trouble comes from a misapprehension of reality, that we are not bad people, there are no evil people, there are no people that are, well, evil in that sense, but they're evil thoughts, they're evil ideas. And as I already mentioned, they're not in the nature of our mind. They're coming out of negative emotions, which have their cause, which have their root, their root cause in a basic misperception, misapprehension of reality, of how the I exists, of how other phenomena exist. And this is what this text deals with. More than just that, but that's the main uh, subject matter of the text we're going to study. But before we go into this, we go back to the Buddha. How does this text that we're going to study, entry into the middle way, how does it connect to the Buddha? Well, quite simple. The Buddha, of course, taught the subject matter we're going to study here, but in a slightly different way. The Buddha taught in a way that was that is confusing for us now in the sense that the Buddha just traveled all over India after he reached what's called the awakened state. He traveled all over India and whoever he met and whoever was interested, who requested the Buddha to talk about his uh, realization, about his understanding, he then taught according to that person's predisposition, interest, aspiration, and so forth based on the assumption, based on, well, not just the assumption, but from a Buddhist point of view, based on the fact that the Buddha was 
all knowing and knew exactly what was best for that past. Not omnipotent, not only omniscient, all knowing as in like omniscient, not omnipotent, could only teach, could only share with everyone else, whoever he met, um, what he had come to know to be true, what he had experienced, to share it with someone else, whoever he met. And then it was up to this person to apply, to practice exactly what he or she had been taught. And that, that being the style of teaching of the Buddha, and sometimes, of course, he taught to crowds of people, but again, always according to the needs of the individual person. And that, even if that meant he had to adjust his teachings to everyone, well, that's exactly what he did. So in that way, the Buddha gave so many different teachings. And it's very difficult to categorize all these different teachings because the style of teaching was such that it was very spontaneous. And again, according to the needs of, of the people present. However, there was still a way um, that was there was some some pattern to his teaching and that's why usually one way of dividing the buddhist teachings to categorize them is into three dharma wheels three wheels of dharma which is just another way of saying three categories of teachings if you like so the first category is when the buddha set forth the four noble truth that i guess you're all familiar with the fact that we will have suffering, we have experiences that we need to recognize that they are there. Many of them we recognize, but many of them we're not aware that they're actually, uh, well, in, in the nature of suffering, if you like, that they're unsatisfactory and that we don't need to have them because they have a cause. They have a cause, they have a root, they have some, they have a well, something that gave rise to these experiences, which are not in the nature of our mind. And in the same way, the causes, the causes that give rise to them, they're not in the nature of the mind. Their root causes the misapprehension of reality and that they can be removed, that there's cessation of those and there's a method that leads to that. So he introduced this idea without really talking much about what's called the ultimate nature of reality. Nonetheless, he did talk about, he did use this terminology, conventional, ultimate, introduce those ideas, um, as was already known in India at the time, an absolute kind of ultimate truth versus a conventional. So he used similar terminology, but explained it slightly differently. He explained the different categories of phenomena, causes, causation was very important, so that our experiences are the results of certain causes. So causation, the law of cause and effect, which includes the law of karma, certain volitional actions lead to certain results. So he gave a very introductory, very um, good foundation during that first turning of the wheel, the main subject matter being the Four Noble Truth. And then during the second turning of the wheel, he introduced the what's called the perfection of wisdom sutras he introduced the explanation of emptiness he introduced emptiness he talked about the ultimate nature of all phenomena so having laid the foundation of how do phenomena exist causes conditions giving rise to our problems what are those problems the dissatisfactory nature of our existence what are the methods methods to get out of it after establishing all that basis on a conventional level he then went beyond that and explained emptiness with the perfection of wisdom sutra so until last sunday we studied one of those which is the heart sutra um, the subject matter of which is, just as the subject matter of the other perfection of wisdom sutras is, emptiness or, well, the ultimate nature of all phenomena, which will be explained as part of this, this uh, text. And so very extensively, explicitly talked about the ultimate nature of phenomena. Implicitly, he talked about other factors as well, bodhicitta, the way to attain enlightenment, and so forth. 
And then there's the third turning of the wheel, which has different aspects. First of all, he, for, for, for his disciples, for some disciple, it seemed this, the first turning of the wheel and the second turning of the wheel, they seemed contradictory. Because in the first turning of the wheel, it seemed like everything was so solidly real, existed as the Four Noble Truth, etc. And then during the second turning of the wheel, he's basically saying nothing exists in and of itself. So to some that seemed like, well, it was contradicting what he said initially, because it sounded like the Buddha was saying there are real Four Noble Truth, there's real suffering. And then during the second turning of the wheel, he was saying nothing really exists as concrete as it appears to us. And so in response to that apparent contradiction that some people saw, he turned the, second, the third turning. And he set forth a philosophical system that's known as mind only. We'll talk more about this as well part of the study here. But not just did he talk about that, not just did he try to resolve this apparent contradiction, but he also talked about the fact that we all have Buddha nature, he introduced, we talked a lot about the mind, the clear nature of the mind and the fact that we can all attain enlightenment, which he had set forth in the second, during the second turning of the wheel, he stressed even more the fact that everyone can attain this if just they have, if, if they have a mind. So those are these three turnings of the wheel of Dharma in short. And many of you have heard about them and you can read more about them. There's plenty of material available. So, but of these three wheels, we are mainly interested in the second wheel, the perfection of wisdom sutras, because they very extensively set forth the main topic here, emptiness. Explicitly emptiness, implicitly implied in the teachings given, of course, also the means and methods to purifying the mind of what's ever extra in the mind, of that which causes us to suffer and which, which hinders us from actualizing our full potential. Now, these teachings, they were not widely given by the Buddha. They were only given to a select few because as we will see, it's easy to misunderstand them. Therefore, it's not given to a huge crowd. In fact, after the Buddha had passed away, of course, they were continued on from one person to the next in an unbroken lineage to an extent that someone actually experienced that which previously was just a theory of what the Buddha taught. It's not an actual experience, but through practicing, through internalizing what they had learned, it had become a praxis, as in like, it's not just theory, it was really true, it was a true experience for that person. And whatever they had experienced, they passed on to the next person in that living kind of lineage. And by way of this living lineage, one person experiencing it, experience what the Buddha had taught and then passing it on to the next, to the next and so forth. However, those teachings were only passed on to a small crowd of people. And it said that they, totally disappeared at some point, at least in this world, whatever that really means. Well, in India mainly, in certain areas, those had totally disappeared. And it took about four or five, 600 years, the numbers here, the years are a little bit difficult to, to uh, determine until the arrival of someone called Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna, who rediscovered these teachings, the perfection of wisdom sutras, he rediscovered them and he reintroduced them. And he gave wonderful teachings, in particular on the main subject matter, again, on emptiness. So he, he, he was a very prolific writer. He, he composed a lot of different um, explanations on the Buddha's thoughts, but he was most famed for six commentaries that were, they're called the six collections of reasoning of which the main treatise, the main text he wrote is called Fundamental Wisdom. It's a very extensive text, mainly on that which during the second turning of the wheel, during the perfection of wisdom sutras, those teachings by the Buddha, 
the explicit meaning of them, he set them, he set forth that explicit meaning. He talked about emptiness, about how phenomena really exist based on cause and effect, based on movement, based on the four noble truth, and so forth, very extensively. So just talked about emptiness. And so it was after the Buddha's passing away for many hundreds of years, these teachings, these extensive teachings on emptiness were hardly existent and then reintroduced by Nagarjuna and have now become more of a mainstream kind of teaching. So together with Nagarjuna's main disciple, Ayadeva, they explained very extensively what emptiness is. That phenomena do not exist as concrete in and of themselves as they appear that we live a life full of contradictions where we do believe that things interact and they're connected but then again we also believe them to have their own nature to be objectively this and objectively that so we live within these contradictions and we totally believe in the appearances to our own mind the appearances of course they're there but they're mistaken appearances and they lead, as well as the Dalai Lama very recently has always been speaking about this, they lead to very harmful emotions. These harmful emotions, they believe in the appearances that arise to the mind. So just like an optical illusion can arise to the mind, can appear to the mind, they're an even deeper illusion, if you like, a deeper mistaken appearance that appears to our mind that rises within our mind and that leads to very harmful emotions that harm us more than anyone else. So the person who has those emotions, they're harmed by those emotional states and they are the main cause for all our problems. And so therefore it's those appearances, holding onto those appearances is true, as very concrete, as phenomena seeming to exist very concrete and very solid, that, that's what leads, that misapprehension leads to an attachment to I being more important than others, my happiness being more important than others, and so forth. We'll go into this in detail, what the text does go into that in detail. So therefore, Nagarjuna basically set forth many, many different reasonings that explain that phenomena cannot exist in that way. And Ayadeva did the same with his text. And at, at the beginning, it was just this explanation of Madhyamika. So that, that was like, well, here there's some disagreement. When was Nagarjuna around? Some say, around the time, like 100 years before Christ, like about five, 400 years after the Buddha's passing away. So the Buddha lived 2,500 years ago. Um, so that means, yeah, like 100 years before Christ, Nagarjuna came. Some say, and that's more uh, accepted, that Nagarjuna lived around the first century of this common era. So AD, um, first century after, after Christ, basically. So, uh, 100, 150 years after, and he set forth, well, mainly this fundamental wisdom, this very, very important, but of course, very difficult text. And then after Nagarjuna, after he just went straight into emptiness, just explaining emptiness in all these details, different reasonings, etc. very difficult, starting off with established establishing first of all that cause and effect don't exist inherently independently objectively as they appear to us so after the buddha taught so extensively in the first turning of the wheel that there's cause effect there's a four noble truth well basically nagarjuna is now taking the subject matter of the second turning of the wheel emptiness and basically starting his text saying cause and effect Although they appear so solid, they don't exist inherently, and so forth. Anyway, it's this entire text, very difficult, but really dealing with emptiness from all sides. All right. And then after Nagarjuna, after Ayadeva, 
there was someone called Buddha Palita. He came around fourth, fifth, fifth century. And he explained what Nagarjuna had said. He explained that. He said it forth, he explained it again. And shortly after that, there was someone called Baba Viveka. Okay, so Buddha Palita first, Buddha Palita. He composed a text explaining what Nagarjuna had said, and of course, in that way, explaining what the Buddha had said. And then someone came called Baba Viveka. And he said, well, what Buddha Palita said, it's not right. They had a debate, the two of them. They had a debate. And that's mentioned also. That's part of our study. And that debate, very important debate, basically is responsible for the school that sets forth emptiness that is called the middle way school to be split into two, into Svatantrika and Prasangika, or the autonomy middle way school and the consequentialist middle way school, autonomy and consequentialist. So, and Baba Vivika basically saying Buddha Palita was wrong Buddha Palita didn't explain this right, and Buddha Palita followed the consequentialist view, the Prasangika view, while Buddha Prabha Vivika followed the autonomy or Svatantrika view, both being part of the middle way, but some difference in this assumption, which we'll explain. And because there was this this division between the two, or this disagreement between those two, there were now two views now, following those two views. And thereafter, after those, this debate had taken place, Chandakirti came. It was later, it was later, but the writings of those two were still around. So the two of like Buddha and Baba Vedika, and then Chandakirti came along and explained Again, he settled this debate. He said, well, Buddha Palita was right. Baba Viveka, well, he gave incredible explanation, but he didn't explain the, the ultimate view of reality in the same way as the Buddha did when he set forth the perfection of wisdom sutras. And so Chandakirti, he's the person we're interested in, a seventh century great Nalanda master who composed two very important texts. Other texts too, but we are mainly interested in two. So, like you heard me say, the word Nalanda. Actually, of course, many of you know this, after the Buddha's passing away, a few hundred years afterwards, this incredible center of learning developed in India, responsible for preserving Buddhist psychology so long until its destruction, however, so long that the Tibetans came to get Buddhism basically, translate it into Tibetan and bring Buddhism to Tibet to preserve it there. It, it disappeared in India around the 12th century, but until about that time, there was this university, monastic, if you like, or Buddhist university, and in that university, you had monks and lay people study together. I, I assume nuns as well. I don't know. Uh, they're not mentioned, but no reason why there weren't, weren't any nuns. So, but definitely Buddhist philosophers and also non-Buddhist philosophers who debated, who meditated, who discussed Buddhism, but also other traditions to keep alive these ideas that were taught by the and Nagarjuna was a Nalanda person, a member of the Nalanda University. Called, he was described as a Nalanda master. So Nagarjuna was, Ayadeva was, Buddha Palita, Baba Viveka, and Chandakirti was true. Chandakirti was true. So Chandakirti, he settled the argument, the debate, which we will go into as part of the study, the debate between Baba Viveka and Buddha Palita. As I said earlier, he said, well, he established that what Buddha Palita said, how he explained emptiness was correct. Baba Vivika was slightly off. Not to say that Baba Vivika didn't say incredible things, but in terms of emptiness, that part he disagreed with. 
And he composed, as I said, two main texts, which one of them we will study here today. So he studied, he, he composed two texts in which he settled the argument, but of course also taught about, talked about or explained Nagarjuna's fundamental wisdom and thereby also the second wheel of the Buddha. That is the perfection of wisdom sutras that the Buddha himself taught during the second term of the Buddha. Okay, so that's basically the background if you like. What's most important is that there are three Dharma wheels the Buddha turned. The Buddha gave three bodies of teaching, if you like. The second teaching deals with this, the, the object. It's that which we need to understand in order to remove our basic misapprehension of reality. And that's really hard to understand because we perceive the opposite of that. So it requires a lot of explanation, which was given by Nagarjuna, for instance, in his text, Fundamental Wisdom. And then later on, 700, well, in the seventh century, of course, also to settle the debate that I mentioned between Bhava Viveka and Buddha Palita, and they probably didn't meet no, it's not sure, it's just they both composed text, and so they'd composed their own books, their own texts, and in Baba Vivika, he criticized Buddha Palita. There was this debate, and that really influenced the Buddhist community at the time in India. And in the seventh century then, Buddha Palita was around the fifth century, Baba Vivika sixth century, and then in the seventh century, Chandrakirti gave the answer to that debate, but also explained, of course, emptiness, explained the second turning of the wheel, Buddha's teachings on emptiness, as well as Nagarjuna's text, um, Fundamental Wisdom. So now we say there are two texts, there are two texts by Chandrakirti. The first text is called Entry into the Middle Way, which we study here. I'm saying it's the first text because that was composed first. And the second text is called Clear Words. The first text called Entry into the Middle Way. The second is called Clear Words. The first text is a more general explanation in particular of Nagarjuna's fundamental wisdom, more general, and of course, by implication, what the Buddha has taught. But why was it more of Nagarjuna? Well, because what we need to understand that although as I kind of raise through the centuries, as I talk about this, it sounds like there's no time in between, but of course there are hundreds of years. In the seventh century, it had already almost been at the, um, more than a thousand years since the Buddha had lived on this earth. And so the style of teaching of the Buddha, I mean, even after the Buddha's passing a few hundred years afterwards, it was outdated in that it was easily the meaning of what the Buddha had said was easily lost because people didn't talk that way any longer, explain things no longer in such a way, and so it needed to be explained again. Just as Shakespeare is a, the way Shakespeare talked and, and wrote his, his plays, we don't talk like that any longer and it requires interpretation. So therefore Nagarjuna's place was to use words that were used at the time, ideas, the style of teaching, etc., that was, that was applied or that was used at the time to explain again what the Buddha had said. But then of course, Nagarjuna's style of teaching, that was at some point outdated, if you like. People no longer easily understood it the way they understood it briefly after, or shortly after Nagarjuna had composed it. So you needed again, that to be explained. And it was by Buddha Palita, it was by Baba Viveka, and then of course also by Chandakirti. So because Nagarjuna had focused totally on emptiness, although the Buddha had focused on much more, but just on emptiness, and because it's such an important topic, 
you had these other masters explain them, Chandakirti again explaining it, but adding more, more to it in his entry into the middle way. So those two texts, therefore, that Chandakirti, the ones we are focusing on, besides, of course, he composed other texts, but we're not interested in them. Those two important texts, one is entry into the middle way, and the other one is clear words, which followed after Chandakirti composed entry into the middle way or entering into the middle way. So the first text, Entering into the Middle Way, was an explanation of emptiness, the way it was set forth by Nagarjuna, but it was more than that. It was more than that. It explained more than just that. It explained also the path to enlightenment. It talked about, for instance, three very important states of mind, which we'll discuss you know, just right at the very beginning of this text. One of them is great compassion, the other one is bodhicitta, and then wisdom. Those three are explained initially. He explained the six perfections, the ten perfections, which are the six plus four more. And in general, just talked about not just emptiness, but also about the path, about the method aspect, the emotional states of love, compassion, etc. So he gave a fuller picture didn't go into all the same kind of reasonings that Nagarjuna went into. It didn't have to because Nagarjuna was already had explained those very clearly, but supplemented it with other aspects. And that's why they say Chandakirti's text, Entering into the Middle Way, is such a great text to, to, to enter into the Madhyamika, to enter into emptiness, which is why this is the most widely studied Madhyamika text in the Galupa tradition. Also in the other tradition is widely studied, but in particular in the, in the Galupa monasteries, although we all study Nagarjuna's text, but not as extensively as Chandakirti's, because it's such a beautiful way to start. And once you understand this text, the other texts are much easier. So it's almost like a, a guide to, or if you, it's, it's like the recipe, if you, if you study this, then it opens the door to all the other texts and you can relatively easily understand, well, Nagarjuna's writing, of course, Ayadeva, of course, it's still difficult, but it's much easier through studying Chandakirti. So that's entering into the middle way. Clear words are not as general as in like including as much as entering into the middle way, but it's more a word commentary. It explains each verse of Nagarjuna's text. So it's also very important, very interesting. If you're interested in Nagarjuna's text, it has been translated, um, it's been made available, well, in, in the form of a commentary. It's, you have um, Jay Garfield's Ocean of Reasoning it's not easy. It's really difficult. Even the English translation is difficult. But anyway, you can study this text. But if you want to, I think a good way to go about it is study the text we study here. And there, there's number one, um, the text you've been made available, uh, the verses themselves that we're going to study together. But then there's also Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary, for instance, that is used in the Galupa tradition to learn this text. And there's so many others. There's Mipam, Mipam Rinpoche's commentary that I believe has been translated into English. Um, and if you go online, you'll find there are other commentaries. There are a lot of explanations. But we'll we will specifically go through the verses of Chandakirti's entering into the middle way, which does not just talk of emptiness. Emptiness is a huge part. It's part of the sixth chapter, which is the most extensive chapter. The other chapters are much briefer. So there's a lot about emptiness, but also about other aspects that I'll mention a little further in a while. To say something, something about Chandrakirti himself, well, that's really difficult because there's not that much known about him. Traditionally, well, the way we write nowadays, the way we compose um, biographies is quite different to the way they were composed in the past. 
I don't think there was that much emphasis on the time they were born, for instance. So numbers were not as important as nowadays. We always know when someone was born. Here it's always uh, circa, it's like, it's not really sure when they were born. So Chandrakirti around 600, 650, so seventh century. Um, there's not much known about his life. They say he was born in a place called Samanta in South India. Um, he was a student of someone called Kamala Budi that no one knows nowadays, really. He's not as known as, as Chandrakirti was. And it's said that there was a prophecy. He was born into a Brahmin family. And there was a prophecy that he would be a great scholar, a great yogi. And his parents were so pleased upon hearing that they sent him to Nalanda University, where he excelled in his studies, but also, of course, in his practice. Um, so didn't get that old if, if we are to believe the the numbers that are given 50 years uh i guess that was kind of old at the time people didn't live as long as they live today but he was a prolific writer and his text this particular one he's most famed for well has been preserved and has been studied for more than a thousand years now and there are a lot of stories about him that are more like anecdotes that that sound um, if you if you don't know that much about Buddhism, they sound like fairy tales, like impossible. Um, there are two I, I remember offhand is the one story where it said that when when Chantakiti was in Atlanta, he didn't want the cows to be milked because if he, he felt bad for the cows to just be giving milk. So he refused to take animal products and the monks at the monastery or the students at the monasteries, monks, nuns, etc., cetera, um, lay people, they still needed to be given milk. They needed milk to, to, for their daily, uh, well, uh, as part of their, their diet. And so milk was always there, but it was not coming from, from the cows. And apparently, he had learned to milk. So he once there was a picture of a cow and he, he was able to milk the picture of the cow. Now that sounds like a what? What's going on? Um, these kind of stories, like he had these miraculous powers um, that we hear from maybe other religious paths and spiritual beings in other religions. We talk about these, these powers and nowadays we have a hard time believing them. But in the whole context of the ability of the mind, the power of concentration, the power, I mean, we know a little bit about the power of the mind, but we cannot really tap into our own power of the mind. So we can do a little things with our mind, but mainly our mind is controlled by lots of emotions. So it just does its wild thing most of the time. And it's very hard for us to imagine you can control your mind to such a degree that it can also control your body, control the environment around you to a certain degree. That's also limited, of course, because it's also beings karma, sentient beings karma. There's that much we can do, but there's certain abilities we can develop. And one of them is said to be, well, walking over water and being able to uh, stop breathing while meditating. And well, there's a whole range of different things. And that's not important from a Buddhist point of view. They're not important. They're just inspiring those ideas, what we can do with our own mind. But anyway, so there's this one story that Chandrakirti was able to milk a, a picture of a cow. And another famous story of him is when there was a war in India at the time when, well, the Buddha was around, then later during uh, the existence of Nalanda University, um, there were wars between different areas in, in India. It wasn't one country the way we know it nowadays, but there were little kingdoms and they sometimes fought with each other. And at some point there was a war happening between two kings and it was really close to Nalanda. And the inhabitants, the people living there were scared. They were scared that the war would affect them. And they asked Chandrakirti to help them. And he had this lion, this lion built and at some time, at some point, when the and ask all the the the, the he, he asked the the beings or the, the the inhabitants of Nalanda to make strong prayers either to Buddha or to Ishvara to God or whatever they believed in, so to be 
to be assisted by the enlightened power, etc., whatever kind of beings there are that we cannot perceive and to be assisted by them. And at some point, this lion actually manifested to be a real lion, went to the battlefield and the war stopped somehow. That's kind of the story. But I don't want to go into details onto details on the of these stories. And this is really what's known about his life. There's also a story of a debate that was happening between another person. Uh, that was uh, an interesting story. Um, but I don't need to go into details on those. I mean, it was not so much about the de debate itself, but that the other person who he was debating with received help from Avalokiteshvara. That's how the story goes. Anyway, those are not that important. These, these mystical kind of ideas, they're not important. They're not that helpful. Maybe they were helpful at the time when they were taught, but we don't believe in these miracles as much. And anyway, like I said, it's most important to understand what they taught. And that's what we're going to do, do here to learn about what in particular Chandakirti taught in his text. But just to give you that short kind of, um, well, introduction in terms of who Chandakirti was. So what's most important is that he was a student firstly of Nalanda University, and later he became one of the teachers there, one of the yogis, one of the meditators, who then composed these two important texts, besides others, of course. For instance, he didn't just compose the entry into the middle way, he composed also what's called a self-commentary. It's a funny word in English, but it's just saying he composed a text and then explained it, because Entering into the middle way is written in verse. So these verses are not always clear. It's not always easy to understand them. And so you composed a text in prose that explained what he meant with each verse. So that's this self-commentary, this auto, auto commentary, as it's also called auto commentary. His Holmes, if you were there during the last teachings, um, when His Holmes the Dalai Lama gave his teachings on this same text not that long ago, two weeks ago. Solness mentioned that these days he reads the auto commentary a lot. He's really started to get into this auto commentary and he actually quoted from this auto commentary. Okay, so I don't believe it's available in English yet, but then you have Lama Itzvon Kapas, even more extensive commentary, which has been made available to you together with the root text, with entering into the middle way, the text we'll study here. Okay, so having heard a little bit about Chandrakirti, it gives you a sense that, that he was an incredible yogi, an incredible master with great abilities, with incredible compassion for other sentient beings. Whatever he did, he did for the welfare of others. And his text has survived for so long because it has proven so helpful. Of course, sometimes when we hear the texts that were composed from the time of the Buddha until now, relatively few. Of course, a lot more were composed, but they didn't all prove as helpful. So only a few were passed on and continued on. And the remaining ones, well, they got lost. Some of his works probably got lost too, but the one that's most important, we still have entering into the middle way. And that now takes me to the text itself. Why is it called Entry into the Middle Way? Actually, it has many different titles in English. I've come across at least three. Supplement to the Middle Way, I've had Guide to the Middle Way, and Entering or Entry into the Middle Way. Of course, the original title was not Entry into the Middle Way. It's actually Madhyamika which means middle way, and then avatara. avatara. Avatara kind of means to enter into, to descend, to enter into. For instance, um, you may have heard of the descent into Lanka Sutra. Lanka Avatara Sutra is the Atara again. Descent into Lanka Sutra it was the Sutra by the Buddha. Um, Buddhist Sutra. So descent, here the word is descent. Or entry into the Bodhisattva Chaya, Bodhi, 
Bodhisattva Chaya Tara, again, you have the Tara, as in like engaging in the activities or the behavior of a Bodhisattva, engaging, entering. So the Tibetan word that is used here has the, has the connotation of entering or engaging. Oh, engaging is another English word that's used. Engaging in the middle way, entering in the middle way. Avatara can also mean to supplement. Okay. So what is meant with the middle way here? When we hear middle way, right away we think, oh, middle way means emptiness. That's true in general. Middle way is actually another word for what's called emptiness. Okay. Which reminds me to say one thing. When we hear the word emptiness, that is, well, it's a word that is used in English, but of course has a negative connotation. Has a negative connotation. My life is empty. There's so much emptiness. Well, we use that same word, but only because we talk about a state of empty and then to make a noun out of it in the same way as it was done in Sanskrit. For instance, when you have shunya, like empty and shunyata as the state of emptiness. Well, for that reason, we borrow that English term, but it has a totally different meaning. It's, it's not negative. It's, it's beautiful. It's the understanding of that is basically the way to happiness. It's the way to experiencing a satisfaction, to experience a um, lasting sense of well-being, which will be explained. So therefore, not to be confusing, most of you probably know that, but just to have mentioned it. So therefore, middle way is just another way for emptiness. In fact, the Tibetan word uma, uma is the Tibetan word for middle way, it just means middle, strictly speaking. But then the Sanskrit word madhyamika means middle or middle way. So saying that this object called emptiness is the middle, it's free from two extremes. Okay, so the middle, it's right in the middle. Okay, like the balanced state. Well, we get to this. So middle way, that's usually emptiness. But here, entering into the middle way, here, middle way, actually means Nagarjuna's text. Nagarjuna's text, fundamental wisdom, is here described as middle way. Fundamental wisdom, Nagarjuna's main kind of text on emptiness that I mentioned early on, 27 chapters just on emptiness. That text is here, that's called the middle way text because it describes emptiness. And Chandrakirti's text is an entry into the middle way or engaging in the middle way or supplementing the middle way. All those words, they work, they work can all be translated in that way, even guide to the middle way. It can be translated in that way because the Sanskrit word carries that meaning. So it's saying supplement is maybe the clearest in the sense that actually Chandrakirti added a little bit. He added a little bit of what Nagarjuna just had mentioned to give the person learning this text a fuller picture of what the Buddha had taught. In the sense that the teachings of the Buddha in the seventh century, but also nowadays, of course, they're not easily understood. They were taught so long ago, so they're not easily understood. And therefore, we need a way to understand them, to explain them. So it's like a, in Tibetan, they sometimes use the word, it's like a key to open a box. It's something that explains, of course, what the Buddha taught by way of explaining what Nagarjuna had, had taught. So therefore, it's entry or it's supplement to the middle way. It supplements what Nagarjuna talked about to understand what the Buddha talked about better. And there is a way in which this is supplemented. So it's usually described there is this supplement, it's supplemented from the point of view of the profound, from the point of view of emptiness, and from the point of view of the conventional, from the point of view of the method, the method part. So in both, 
parts are dealt with the the method part which includes love compassion etc so Chandakirti's text supplements Nagarjuna's text with regard to that but it also supplements the profound the, the, the wisdom aspect how does he supplement that well Nagarjuna didn't mention other philosophical schools in particular didn't talk about bind only didn't mention uh, Madhyamika Svatantrika, as I mentioned those earlier, the middle way school, that's autonomy middle way school versus Prasangika or consequentialists, and they become a little clear as we go along. So however confusing it is now, bear with me. So he didn't differentiate between what is consequentialist and autonomist, didn't differentiate between those two, and didn't differentiate either between what's called mind-only school and non-mind-only school. But Chandakirti did. So he explained the difference between them for us to understand emptiness better. Then on the asp, on the asp, on the side of the, so he supplemented Nagarjuna's explanation with this explanation, explaining clearer some of those other philosophical views. So to understand better the view that we are trying to understand here, the consequentialist view. At the same time, he also talked about the, the, the other aspects, the methods aspects. He talks about the three, the three qualities of still an ordinary person, ordinary as in like a mundane person, and we come to that, compassion, bodhicitta, and wisdom, and why they're for a mundane person, it'll become clear. He talked about the perfections, the different perfections, the six, the ten. And in that way, he supplemented the text. So he supplemented the wisdom aspect of Buddhism and he supplemented the method aspect of Buddhism. All right. So I've given you a lot of information. I know for some of you it's easier, for some of you it's harder. But just to kind of say it once again, well, we're studying a text which was composed around the seventh century, a long time ago, which of course explained the Buddha's teachings on emptiness, but not just that, also the Buddha's teachings on the path, bodhicitta, compassion, and so forth, based on what the Buddha taught, but also based on what Nagarjuna taught in his text, Fundamental Wisdom. And Chandakirti taught his text, he's got 11 chapters, his text got 11 chapters. And the name already suggests, all right, it's the supplement, it's the entering into the middle way, entering into the middle way by way of teaching certain aspects that were not taught by Nagarjuna, for instance, or were not taught by Nagarjuna. And it starts off, the text already starts off. And if you go to the text, if you open the text, if you can, you probably have it, or maybe we can, we can uh, put it on the screen so you could follow it. Okay, the first page. If you scroll down a little bit, it says first ground, perfect joy. I'll say something to that, if you could scroll a little bit here. Oops, what happened? My screen, can you still hear me? Yes, we can oh. see that page. Ah, oh, you can steer, all right. It, my, somehow mine is frozen, Never mind. it's okay. Um, you can see that page, all right, so. It says the first ground, perfect joy. That's just the title of, that's the title of the first chapter. The title of the first chapter, the first chapter, it starts off first of all with great compassion. It starts off with great compassion. Very important. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. You can. Okay, that's most important. So the first chapter starts off with what's called great compassion. 
But as I said earlier on, it also deals with the 10 perfections. So each chapter discusses one of the perfections. Therefore, the first chapter discusses the perfection of generosity. And we'll come to that. It talks about generosity in a very beautiful way. Great, there we are. It talks about compassion, sorry, about generosity in a very beautiful way. But before we come to that, it first, sorry, it talks about generosity in a very beautiful way. But before we get to that, it describes compassion. Okay, it describes compassion. Now, when you hear the first ground, perfect joy, why is it titled? Why is it given that name? Well, the reason is that someone who is on the path to becoming a Buddha, person called a bodhisattva, someone who's training to become, who wants to become a Buddha, who has that spontaneous aspiration to become a Buddha for the welfare of all sentient beings, such a person goes through different levels, mental levels. And usually they're said to be four main levels. And the last of those four is subdivided, or sorry, the last two of those four is subdivided into 10 grounds or 10 sub-levels. So we'll get into this, but just for now, and we'll have more discussion and more explanation, but just for now, there are four levels before a person becomes enlightened. And the last two levels are again divided into 10 levels or 10 grounds. And here, the first chapter is given the name of the first ground, the first of those 10 grounds, which accounts for this having 10 chapters and the 11th chapter is then the level of Buddhahood. It describes what it means to be a Buddha. That's the 11th chapter. 10 chapters, each chapter deals with one of those grounds also called Bhumi. Bhumi is the Sanskrit word. But that's not interesting for now. That's just the background information. You don't need to get into this, what this exactly means. You'll come to this. So just to have the title, but now what you see is here there's a verse, no, not a verse, there's a word or a sentence. I pay homage to the gentle Lord Manjushri. Now this, 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 this sentence is actually not from Chandakiti. Chandakiti didn't say those words. They were said by someone called Patsap Nimata. Patsap Nimata. He was a Tibetan. He was the translator who translated Chandakirti's text. Of course, it was composed in Sanskrit. It was composed by an Indian Nalanda master. And the language they used was Sanskrit. And for it to be studied by Tibetans, well, Atisha himself, and not just Atisha, of course, also Shantarakshita and Kamala Shila. It started off with Shantarakshita and Kamala Shila in the 8th century. They were responsible for Buddhism to be introduced to Tibet, not just Shantarakshita and Kamala Shila, of course, also Guru Rinpoche, Pema Sambhava. So those great yogis and masters, they were responsible for Buddhism fast to come to Tibet. They were invited to Tibet by the king at the time called Tisung Ditsen. So he invited Shantarakshita, Kamalashila and uh, Guru Mbuchi or Padmasambhava to Tibet to spread Buddhism there. And at that time, Shantarakshita mainly, he advised the Tibetans not to learn Sanskrit, well, of course, but mainly to focus on translating what's available in Sanskrit or Pali, but mainly Sanskrit into Tibetan. And so the texts were slowly translated, but of course it took time. It took time for all these texts to be translated into Tibetan. And it was only 
after the eighth century, so Shantarakshita and, and Kamala Shila and Gudrumbuchi, at that time, this text was not translated. Then around the 12th century, there was Atisha. Atisha came to Tibet, the great Atisha. There were some problems in Tibet. There was some degeneration of Buddhism in Tibet. And so he reintroduced some of the aspects that had degenerated and introduced also the Lamrim, the Lamrim texts. So uh, his, his writings, his Lamrim texts, they were later then expanded onto different Lamrim texts. So he composed texts that are called texts that are graduated stages to the path to enlightenment a very specific genre of teaching, which are relatively easy set forth the different stages towards enlightenment. So only after Atisha had passed away, there was this great translator called Patsap Nimantra. He translated Chandakirti's text and that's when it became widely known. So this is when Nagarjuna's thought really became strongly established. Already Atisha, of course, talked about Nagarjuna's tenets, his philosophical views, but really with the translation of this text, Chandakirti's text became really well known in Tibet. And Batsa, Batsa Lotsawa, as he also is called, Batsa Lotsawa just means translator. So he actually was born in Tibet, but his family moved to Kashmir in India. Kind of interesting, right? Tibetans even moved to other countries at that time and, and grew up, he grew up there. And I suppose he knew Tibetan, but he also of course learned Sanskrit and he became um, very, very well-learned. He learned about Buddhism, he had great gurus, great lamas who taught him. And so he knew both Sanskrit and Tibetan and at some point moved to Tibet and translated very important texts such as this text here, and I believe was a clear word and the, the, the auto commentary of this particular text here, the Madhyamika Avatara or entering into the middle way. He translated all these texts and his words here, I pay homage to the gentle Lord Manjushri. Those were his own words. Those were his own words. Basically as being a translator, um, he paid homage to Manjushri and because he paid homage to Manjushri, it became clear that the subject matter of this text is mainly wisdom. Because at the time when Buddhist texts were translated from Sanskrit into Tibetan, there was a general rule, not everyone adhered by that rule, but some did and Patsap Lotsawa, the translator, he definitely did that when you paid homage at the beginning towards a certain entity, the reader knew whether the subject matter was either wisdom or concentrated, concentrative meditation or um, um, morality or ethical conduct, ethical discipline. Because the reason being that earlier on, I just said that the Buddha's teachings can be divided into three Dharma wheels, into the three wheels. Another way in which the Buddha's teachings can be divided is into three categories again, but this time slightly differently, um, into three, as I call, baskets. The Sutra basket, the Abhidharma basket, and the Vinaya basket. So, which is just another way of saying into those teachings that mainly talk about ethical conduct, that's the Vinaya basket, the, 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 the basket of ethical discipline. Then there's the Sutra, the Sutra basket, which mainly deals with concentrative meditation. And then there's the wisdom or there's the Abhidharma basket, which mainly describes wisdom. So they describe all the other topics as well, but the main emphasis is on those. And if a translator at the time when the texts were translated from Sanskrit into Tibetan, if the translator translated, if the translator prostrated towards Manjushri, the Buddha of, of, um, the Buddha of wisdom, then the subject matter was mainly wisdom. 
if the the translator translate um prostrated or paid homage to the um to the omniscient mind of a buddha it was ethical conduct and if the the translator um, bowed that is paid homage to um ethical conduct those teachings that mainly deal with ethical conduct he bowed to buddhas and bodhisattvas okay so it's just a way to find to know which of those three trainings as they're called ethical discipline concentration and wisdom is the main topic of this text all right so and then it says i pay homage to the gentle lord manjushri and afterwards chandrakirti's words start so what does he what does chandrakirti now do every text starts off with paying homage to something um paying homage in the sense of paying your respect towards something. It kind of makes sense here in this case, again, although Buddhist psychology, well, but basically the idea is there's so much to learn. I understand I have more to learn and this is my example. So it's kind of like for the person writing the text, but also for the person hearing the text to be inspired. But also the person composing here, in this case, Chandrakirti, what am I aspiring towards? What is it that I, I want other people to, to know about? And then to pay your respect towards this. And in this case, it was great compassion. So what did he start off teaching? What did Nagarjun, sorry, Chandrakirti first talk about? He talked about what's called great compassion. Great compassion is this most beautiful mind it's a type of mind and i ask you in the very beginning as part of your motivation to generate a mind that has that's a loving attitude towards all sentient beings wishing them to be free from suffering that's a type of mind well we don't have that naturally we have compassion of course but not towards all sentient beings and that is one of the most important aspects of Buddhism, that type of compassion. This is a type of mind that we can all generate through habituation. And we do this and I make you meditate on this as part of, well, we started off with this. We can all generate this. And that is said to be the entry into the teachings that lead us to enlightenment. Now, it's not about wisdom here. You could have paid homage to wisdom to the buddhas and bodhisattvas he doesn't pay homage to these great beings why not because he's saying that which caused these great beings was compassion it's compassion that turns us into these incredible beings and that's why he pays homage in such a beautiful way basically what he's saying with the first first chapter he's saying all these great practitioners call them shravakas call them middle level buddhas and all this will be explained so all these practitioners buddhas bodhisattvas they're all born from compassion right so all these sentient beings all these living sorry these great beings they're all the results of compassion okay so he describes three causes of those three but of those three mainly compassion now time is almost up um we didn't do a meditation today as i announced in the very beginning we only did a little bit at the beginning we'll do this next time because we'll start with compassion next time the verses will be explained to you um we'll have an hour and a half as before we'll do some meditation on compassion as well of course but i would like you to read this in advance if you can if you have the time start off definitely with those verses the first 10 20 verses however much you can manage take lama tsongkhapa's commentary that's not easy easily understood but as much as you understand that's that's well great because the more you've read in advance the easier it gets for you to understand this and then uh, we go through the different verses uh, we'll have some question and answer time and you have the opportunity of course we will take time to meditate all right so that should be enough for today
what is it, 20, 28 minutes? Yeah, 29 minutes. Now, what we should do, or what we, how we could end this, this session now, very important, to dedicate whatever positive potential we have accumulated to hear about Nagarjuna, Chandakirti, and of course, having started this text, whatever positive potential we've accumulated here together, may this become a cause for us ourselves to generate great compassion, to generate wisdom, understanding reality as described by Chandakirti, as a means to removing the misapprehension of reality that is actually not in the nature of our mind and thereby to remove all the harmful emotions, afflictive emotions, hatred, attachment, jealousy and so forth, to then purify the mind of all these aspects and generate the fully awakened state of a, of a Buddha. Not for our own welfare alone, but for the welfare of all sentient beings. So let's dedicate towards our own enlightenment. Well, let's do Chantideva's um, dedication prayer. Yeah, let's do this today. Let's do it together. And again, motivation where you're, you're the dedication we just thought of in the back of your mind, keep that. And then at the same time, let's recite those words. May all beings everywhere, yeah. by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled by the mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water in delicious drinks. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all the medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power. People think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. Okay, great. Uh, that's it. So really for this week, what I would like you to do, I did that when we studied the Heart Sutra together. From your side, for this week, all it is to read in advance um, those verses, those first 10, 20 verses, if you can, think about them, to you understand something. Um, if you can read Lama Tsongkhapa's uh, text at the same time, that's great. But also be patient with yourself, not understanding everything, because not everything is easy and it needs uh, some explanation. All right, that's it. Have a great week and see you next Sunday, same time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Geshe-ma. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Oh, Frida saying. <laughs> thank you. Bye.